Good morning. My name is Christy Burdick Travis, and I work here at the University of St. Thomas. And I want to welcome you to today's first of our fall online learning sessions. Um, the purpose of these sessions is to serve our community by providing access to some of our favorite faculty and provide um, to give you a showcase to what we do here in executive education at St. Thomas, as well as to provide a learning opportunity um, for you online. So we actually started this series this past summer and um, had such a strong response and such great feedback that we're doing it again this fall. So today is the first. Um, I also wanted to make you aware that November 5th, we are actually doing one with um, Wayne Call, and that will be on Agile Project Management. And then this December, we'll be doing another one that's on Emerging Technology. So more information is available about both those sessions on our website. Um, a couple of just logistical operational things about how we're going to work today. This session is going to be about 45 minutes and we're going to um, provide um, access to questions um, in the last um, end of the session. Please use the chat function um, on the website as the session is going to submit your questions and just know at the end of the session we'll actually go back and have an opportunity to, to um, ask Leo those questions. Um, we're also going to be making the slides that Leo is using today available as well as a recording of this session. Um, they'll be sent um, in the days following this session. Um, and with that, I'm going to move on to introducing today's um, speaker. And that is Leo Hoff, who is um, actually, uh, he is an adjunct um, faculty here. He's an executive education instructor. Um, he teaches in our St. Thomas Executive Program, which we call STEP. He also teaches in our mini MBA program. And he's teaching in a new program that we're starting this fall called New De Decision Making and Execution. Um, he teaches similar content at Stanford University um, to graduate students. And Leo is also the author of this book that I have right here. And it is called Rethink, Reinvent, Reposition, 12 Strategies to you Renew Your Business and Boost Your Bottom Line. Um, he also is the manage, has worked as the managing director at the management consulting firm Strategic Decisions Group. So Leo has worked with um, a lot of executives, a lot of boards, um, and has led strategy and decision making efforts in over four, 15 countries across the world. So comes with a wealth of experience um, and he has applied that to more than 40 industries. So Leo earned his Master's of Business Administration with the highest distinction from Tuck School of Business. He has his Bachelor of Science degrees in Chemical Engineering and Metallurgical Engineering from U of M. He might have to correct my pronunciation. I still can't say it. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I think this is, um, I'm a sports fan, so I think this is a really fun fact. So Every year, Leo actually works with the NCAA Final Four volleyball teams and um, teaches the coaches about how to make better decisions and to better lead their, their teams and their organizations. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Leo. Thank you, Leo. Let's start with a decision. Your decision makers, and I'm bringing this to you, it's a $2 million investment. And there's some chance it'll work and some chance it won't work. If it does work, you're going to make back your $2 million plus another 10. So $12 million minus 2 is going to give you $10 million benefit. Now, the chance it's going to work, you think it's about a 40% chance. So it's a 40% chance of $10 million, 60% chance minus $2 million. So there's some risk attached. And if you think about organizations, the organizations love risk or, or not like risk. And what causes it? Everyone complains that their organization is risk averse, but they don't stop to think why it's risk averse. So when I'm doing this with a, a leadership team, I'll present this case and very quickly, they'll come back to with many of the same answers I think that you have. Uh, so if I were to ask, what questions would you ask me? You'd probably say, hmm, 4060 says who based on what? What kind of assumptions are there? What kind of knowledge is there? Why, why would I believe that? Uh, who came up with the 10 million? Who came up with the minus two? Hmm. Well, 
10 too, that's the financial side, but what about the strategy side? Is that connected to what we do, to our core competencies? Maybe there should be other columns, a strategic fit column. Does this leap us ahead of the competition? Does it just play catch up to them? Huh, you know, Leo, maybe I should think about doing a test study. Rather than 10 minus two, maybe I could test it in one group and turn it into one minus 0.2. And then if that works, it's not gonna be 40% chance of work, maybe 80% chance. So very quickly, people come back with all these questions and they're all the right questions. You know those questions. The challenge is not, how do I have the individual specific questions which I know I'm supposed to ask, but there's something deeper than that, which causes organizations to have difficult time taking this. Now, is this a good investment? On average, 40% of the time we'd make 10 million, that's 4 million. 60% of the time we'd lose 2 million, that's 1.2 million. Four minus 1.2 is what, 2.8 million. So on average, every time I did this, I'd make 2.8 million. Problem is, each person who comes up with the investment only gets to do it once. So they don't see it as on average, this is a great thing. They see it as 40% chance I'm a hero and make 10 million. And 60% chance my career is kind of limited because I've lost 2 million. Okay? If you lose that 2 million, even if it was a smart investment, that's going to sting. And let's look at the other side. Suppose you make the 10 million. What is your benefit for that? Not, not the company's benefit, yours. What percentage of that 10 million will get cut as a check to you personally? Does he say, will you get 10% just a million bucks? 1%, uh, $100,000? Uh, maybe you get a pizza lunch on Friday. That's sort of the upside for taking this risk. You get 60%, most likely, your career is gonna be taking a hit because most likely it's not gonna work. So it's a smart investment for the company, but it kind of hurts you, it's hard for you to take. And here's a question that I think is at the core of why organizations have a tough time taking risks in their decisions. And, and people usually don't think about it, and here it is. Where do you think the energy will go? Finding ways to increase the upside and bring that 10 million up to 15 million. Okay. Think cleverly, how can we get, take this good opportunity to turn it into a great one? Or, finding ways to decrease the risk and bring the downside to zero. When I do this with leadership team, I ask, raise your hand if you think it's on top, raise your hand if you think it's on bottom, you get 90% plus or minus on the bottom. Organizations are not about getting full value from their decisions, they're about not making mistakes. And particularly not making mistakes with your name attached as the person who brought it up. So why would an intelligent person ever take a risk? If it works out, you don't get much personally. If it doesn't work out, everyone focuses on the downside. And if you think about the conversations with decision makers, are all the conversations, I'm gonna ask you two questions. You tell me which one would actually be asked in your organization. Here's the first question. Suppose we do this investment and it goes bad. The market's not responding. What could we do to back away so we don't lose that for full $2 million? Okay. That's one question. Here's the second question. Suppose this thing goes big, what could I invest in today at low cost so I could triple my investment six months faster than I otherwise could? Now, I would argue for most of you, it's that first question that gets asked. We hammer on the downside. How can we minimize the loss? How can we minimize our exposure? And we know 85% of all that could be known on the downside because that's where all the questions are. And we're basically clueless on the upside because no one's asking. So we're not looking for full value. We're not looking to take all the benefit we can. We're looking to not make mistakes. That's why organizations are risk averse, not because all of these risky investments like this come up to the board and the board says, oh, that's, that's too much risk, I can't do that. It's because the board never sees these. They never see the best ideas. Because if I'm inside the organization, I don't have to bring this up. I can instead clean up last year's long range plan. Now I've got a 70% chance things will go well and I'll make half a million. 30% chance they'll go okay and I'll make 300,000. Now, what's the personal risk to me on that path? 
not much. It's probably going to work. I'm going to do a little bit better than last year. And so I'm not going to show this risky investment. I'm going to show this thing that kind of is going to work because when you do something at your organization, ask yourself this, is it kind of supposed to uh, uh, work? If things are kind of supposed to work, you're going to have a difficult time making intelligent investments. So somehow we need to change the conversation to get away from that endpoint, that 10 minus 2, the 4060, to say, how can we talk about, is this the right decision to make? Should we take the top path and invest, take the bottom path, clean up last year's long-range plan? That's a decision to make. Okay? How do we make that decision, and what conversations and what tools do we have to make high-quality decisions? Because if all I do is judge on the endpoint, if all I do is judge on that 10 minus 2, Smart people can't do that. A 60% chance of a career limiting move is just too high. I've got to play it safe. So why are organizations risk averse? Because people down in the organization don't want to take a chance at risking their careers so they present things that are kind of going to work. And in fact, that's what their bosses are asking for. Okay? Talk about good execution. I want to see it work. Okay? Let's talk about then how do we, how do we make high quality decisions that enable us to take intelligent risks. To do that, we have to think about what makes decision making difficult. And there's basically two main categories. One is clarity. It's hard to get clarity on the highest value course of action. So if you were king, if you were queen, you didn't have to get anyone to agree with you, you're an absolute monarch. What would you do to get the most value? And for most Decisions, that's not obvious. You have to spend a lot of time thinking about it, gathering information, running simulations, running financials. So it's hard to get the right answer. That's the clarity side. The other piece is alignment. We need to have everyone pulling in the same direction. Okay, so how do we get all the players who have a role pulling in the same way? If you get clarity without the alignment, you get the right answer, but nobody cares. Nothing happens. You get alignment without clarity. Everyone's doing it. Everyone feels confident. And even if you succeed, nothing's going to happen because there's just not a lot of value to be had. Okay. In order to make intelligent decisions, we need to think about what makes what things set the quality of that decision. And there are seven attributes, seven attributes. I've been studying decision for 30 years. Uh, I haven't found an eighth. Seven attributes, whether the decision is large or small. If it's a large decision, you're going to spend more time in the seven attributes. If it's a small one, you might just use them as a checklist. If it's trivial, you may not think of them as all because it's, it's not even worth to think about. But here are the seven. Number one, objectives. When you think about objectives, don't just think about, well, I know money is an objective. It always is. But there are always other things as well. Instead, think, who are the players and what do they want? A player is someone whose perspective should be considered in making the decision. And what they want, they probably want three, four things. So maybe the first thing is, is money, second is this, third is that. And as an example, one of my clients is a, uh, a large HMO, health maintenance organization, a healthcare chain. And they brought me in on the simplest decision I've ever been brought in on my entire career. They were going to put in a new hospital in Oakland, California. They'd already decided on all the difficult things, how many beds, what the services are. Everything was set except the location. And they could either do it location A, or location B. That was the only decision left. They studied it six times, six times over the course of two years, and they couldn't decide. Seventh time, they brought uh, my group in, and we asked, who are the players, what do they want? Turns out the physicians who ran the place wanted a short commute. And they were the owners, so they could certainly choose that. But let me ask you, on those first six efforts, how much time do you think was spent estimating commute time from the Oakland Hills where the physician lived to location A during rush hour and to location B during rush hour? The answer is no time. What they said at first is, hey, you should build at B because B is cheaper. And the response I got was, well, refine the numbers coming again because B was cheaper, but A was closer. And as many times, they came back the second time, they said, B is cheaper. They said it louder. 
but they had missed one of the key objectives. So when you think about objectives, think who are the players and what do they want? It's not just one thing. What is the second, third, and fourth thing? Uh, second of the seven is structuring. Structuring is not the answer. It's what decision are we really working on? So you think about structuring, think about givens. The more givens you have, the more you can define exactly what decision you're working on. So for example, if I came, uh, uh, I don't live now, I grew up in, in Minneapolis, but I don't live here now. But suppose I was moving back and I went to a realtor and I said, find me a place to live. What's the chance the realtor would come back with something that would make sense for me? I would argue virtually none, that that is an undelegatable problem because I haven't given her enough givens. If I said, well, I need a place to live, I'd like it to be within 20 minutes commute of downtown Minneapolis. I need at least three bedrooms. I need a two car garage. I'd like it to be a new build or recently remodeled because I'm not a project guy. And I'd like it to be a, a modern style, sort of think concrete and glass style as opposed to uh, uh, an old stately mansion style. I would argue with those small set of givens, five or six, I've now defined a decision and the realtor could run away and work on it and come back with probably pretty good alternatives for me. But I couldn't do that until I gave her the givens. That's what structuring is. Knowledge. When people think about knowledge, they always think about what's the answer. So this is a, this is, what is the revenue going to be from this investment two years from now? Well, there are no facts about the future. The future is all about ranges. Could be as high as this, could be as low as that. It could be as fast as this, as slow as that. So when you think about knowledge, don't think about what the answer is. Think about how uncertain is that answer. Okay, so don't think this will cost me 2.6 million. Think one time in 10, it could be as high as 4 million, one time in 10, as low as two. It's that range of uncertainty that adds the risk to your return. A couple of interesting points on knowledge. Uh, Clayton Christensen, the author of The Innovator's Dilemma, talks about disruption uh, uh, and has a couple words to say on knowledge. How can you make sense of the future when you only have data about the past? You need to be able to marry your data about the past with your view about how the world is changing in order to make intelligent predictions about the future. Uh, and here's a kind, I'd never thought of this concept my entire life until I read it in his book, but I think it's, it's a, a fascinating concept. The higher you go in the hierarchy, the less information is available, which kind of doesn't seem like it makes sense. You think the bosses should have everything, but, but think about this. If you're in the middle of an organization, you have bad news, what do you do with it? You deal with the problem, fix it, and maybe your boss doesn't really need to know all the details. So all bad information sort of stays and goes down. Information is heavy. It sinks in the organization. Good news always goes to the top. Of course, I'm going to tell my boss the good news. So what happens? The decision makers here, everything is going great, 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 great. And they never hear about the real challenges. So they don't get the full picture of all the knowledge inside the organization. The fourth piece is choices. And oftentimes we have just one choice. Either I do it or I don't. And if that's the case, if it's a do it or don't, you haven't thought well about what your really true opportunities are. The world is not a do it or don't kind of place. The world is, there's a lot of things we could do. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my projects was in Nigeria. It was an oil and gas company. And when you drill for oil, you get oil and gas. You can't help it. Natural gas are mixed together. And uh, the CEO of this oil company went on TV and says, we're going to reduce the amount of flaring we do around the world for environmental reasons. What's a flare? You ever go by a, a refinery and you have all that, that big long tube and the fire coming out, that's called a flare. You have to, some things are not economic to upgrade, you just have to burn them. Well, in Nigeria at the time, they had no industry that used natural gas. And so they would drill, they'd bring out the oil and gas, they would sell the oil on the world market and they would burn all of the gas. So in fact, they had the largest flare in the world, which is obviously wasteful, obviously polluting, bad things. CEO says, we're going to fix it. How do we do that? Well, we came up with some alternatives. One is stop drilling. You've got five years left in the concession. Stop drilling, milk the investment, and leave. Another was create an industry that uses natural gas. 
If you invested $3 billion, you could build a liquefied natural gas plant. But those are so big, you actually need to have more gas than you have now, so you have to increase your drilling. Okay. Another was called gas reinjection. Take the gas and build big compressors, which are like pumps for gas, but instead of liquid, and pump the gas back underground. And if you need it 20 years from now, you can bring it back up. Okay. Now, which of those was chosen doesn't really matter, but there was a choice. It wasn't just do this or not. We had a range from leave, create a new industry that uses natural gas, to the reinjection. Now, here's something that was pretty cool. The team met us the first day we landed in Nigeria. The team met us at the airport, and they had made team T-shirts. They were white T-shirts with a red team name across. Day, day one on the project. And here's what the team name was. They were the Gas Reinjection Team. Gas Reinjection Team. So they were thinking about pumping the gas back down, the, building the big compressors. How much were they going to learn about leaving and stopping the concession? Nothing. How much were they going to learn about liquefied natural gas? Nothing. They already had their answer. We're going to reinject. What are our alternatives? Make a big compressor, medium compressor, small compressor. So you think about choices. Think about not what is the perfect answer, but think what is the range of answers. Evaluation. Evaluation is in some sense the easiest of the seven. How do each of the things, how do each of our choices rate on each of our objectives? So if we take that hospital location, uh, once we understood that uh, commute was important, we looked at adding a parking ramp for physicians. They didn't have one at first. Uh, so we have four alternatives, A with no ramp, A with a ramp for physicians, B no ramp, B with a ramp. And we said the things that matter, that who are the players, what do they want, cost of the facility, Physician commute, member driving time. Now, the members didn't get to park in the, the lot. It was only for physicians. And some lived by A and some lived by B. But on average, it was a wash. And so since the members all rated everything exactly the same, we can just get rid of that column. So they studied this six times over two years. What's the fundamental trade-off? If you go from the top 395 to 330, there's a $65 million spread from the most expensive to the least. So the answer is, is it worth $65 million to go from the worst commute to the best? It's a simple trade-off. In one sentence, you could say the trade-off that had held them up for two years. Okay? Some of the uh, uh, things we're going to measure against in our evaluation are uh, financial, dollars. Some are qualitative, but both may matter. Execution. Is everyone needed for successful execution aligned and committed, which, which raises the question, Aligned and committed to what? What is a decision? A decision, you ever go to a meeting and you're presenting and all the big folks are there and they're nodding their heads and you leave the meeting and nothing ever happens? So a decision isn't a nodding of heads. A decision is an irrevocable allocation of resources, an allocation of resources you can't undo. Okay? Until you've done that, you haven't decided it's all talk. So if you decide and then decide again when it's time to invest, you never decided the first time because the decision is the allocation of resources. And sometimes people decide, but then they second guess themselves the first time they hit a bump in the road. But trees don't grow very well if you pull them up every three months to see how the roots are doing. And that's not, that says you didn't really decide the first time because you never really committed. You, you put a foot in the water, but you reserve the right to second guess yourself. If you do that, that trains people not to work hard to execute the first decision because they think it's going to be second guessed. Uh, last one, people, culture, decision process. Do we have the right people involved both to make the decision and to work the decision? And are we making this decision in a way that makes sense for us? And for many organizations, what makes sense is consensus. Let's get everyone to agree. And, and it sounds like a good thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we all did agree? But consensus is evil. It's not just bad business practice. It's not just frustrating. It's not just dumbing down. It's evil, which the dictionary defines as harmful or injurious. Because consensus holds us hostage to our least visionary, least creative, and least risk-taking person. It slows decision-making down due to endless meetings trying to get everyone on board. Okay? 
And if we get on board, no one can agree on a contingency plan. So decision-making is not about everyone gets a vote and everyone can hold up the process. Decision-making is about leadership. Who should make the decision? Give the right people the votes, but recognize not everyone will be involved in every single decision. Now we have seven attributes. There's always one that's gonna be your first limit. There's always a rate limiting step. So of the seven attributes, which of the seven limit the quality? And the answer is whichever of the seven is the weakest for that particular decision. If you did a great job on, all, on the other six, but knowledge was poor, garbage in, garbage out. Did a great job in everything else, but structuring was poor, you solved the wrong problem. Great job in everything else, but execution was poor, get the right answer, nothing happens. The challenge is organizations know how to work on what they're good at. To achieve decision quality, you have to work on your uncomfortable weaknesses, not just your comfortable strengths. So how are we going to do this? We'll take a stoplight, red, yellow, green. Red, if you're red an attribute, it means you don't, you're not ready to decide. You probably don't even know, need the right questions yet, much less the right answers. Green means go. More work wouldn't be worth its cost. Yellow, proceed with caution. Answers may still change. So here is an actual decision, meeting one, two, three, and four and how the decision makers rated where they are. So at the first meeting, meeting one, we're green on structuring, but you know what? I've got a bunch of ways to improve the structure and to make it clearer. Should I do that? Because I can make it better. I can make it clearer. And the answer is no, because it doesn't help to go from pale green to spring green to forest green to dark green if you're red someplace else. Because of the work of the decision is to turn the reds to yellows, yellows to greens, and to do nothing on the greens. Now, how do you judge that? Here's a one-page decision quality diagnostic, and this is your homework after this session. I want you to take a real decision that you have in your organization and look at those first two questions on objectives. If you have good answers for those questions, give yourself a green. If you have bad answers, you're red. If you have okay answers, you're yellow. So you get a color, red, yellow, or green, and objectives. Then go to structuring. Good answers, you're, red, you're green. Bad answers, you're red. Okay, or yellow. So give yourself a color on each of the seven. And now you've got that red, yellow, green. So the reds are the things that you need to fix in order to make the decision. Greens, don't do any work on. It takes about two minutes, maybe three, to do a decision quality diagnostic on a real, pro on a real decision. And what it may show you is a lot of work you plan to do just isn't needed because, yes, it would refine things, but you're already green. Instead, spend your time where you're on the red side. So this is a specific tool you can use. You'll get this slide, uh, and I'd encourage you to take the three minutes, apply it to a real decision. Now, that is how you measure the quality of decision, the seven attributes. But the question now becomes, how do you communicate with the workers and the decision makers as to the qual what that quality is. We know the seven attributes, that's how we measure the quality, but how do we have that conversation between workers and decision makers? How do decision makers test the quality of the work? And I'm gonna put my clicker down just for a moment because this is the single most important slide I'm gonna present. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it and I want you really to think about it. And I learned this early in my career. I started out, I was a chemical engineer, and my very first project was called the naphtha splitter. I was trying to say, should we invest in the naphtha splitter or not? That was back in the days when I said, do you do it or not? So I fell into that trap. But my job was the naphtha splitter. Uh, first product I ever did. I spent six months on it. What does the naphtha splitter do? I don't remember. It was a long time ago. But I spent six months on it, doing engineering calculations, financial calculations, running it through the corporate models. And my boss, she had a week to spend on the splitter. Her boss had a day. The CEO heard about it on the elevator ride between the 39th and 52nd floors one day. So they didn't have as much time as I, they didn't sit shoulder to shoulder to me. They didn't have as much time as I did to know the quality of the work. So how did they test it? Well, my boss reached into her quiver, took out an arrow. So, well, Leo, you think about this. And I dodged out of the way and hit page down. Yeah got a slide on that right here. All right, fine, Leo. What about that? And she shoots another arrow. Yes, even if costs are 10% more, still makes corporate hurdles. So what happens to her confidence as I answer those arrows? 
it goes up. Is she shooting arrows because she doesn't like me? She didn't, but that's, that's pain still there, I guess. She was shooting arrows because she had to find out if I had made a mistake someplace. And she couldn't test everything, so she shot arrows to test individual things. What happens, by the way, when she hits me with an arrow and I don't have the answer and the blood starts to leak down and the sharks start to circle? Boy, that didn't, that didn't go to a Lee didn't know that. I wonder what else he didn't know. And now the arrows really start to fly. So think about you at your own organization. Think about this. How many of you have been hit by an arrow? When I do this with a, a group, virtually all the hands go up. Then I ask, how many of you have ever shot an arrow? And the same number of hands go up. That's how you're trained to test quality. You get arrows shot at you, and then as you grow up and get higher in the organization, you get to start shooting a few more, and why stop? It's a lot funner to shoot than to be shot at. It comes almost like a game. How can I show I'm the smartest person because I could find something I didn't think of and hit him with that arrow? Shooting arrows is universal. I've, I've, I've led strategy efforts 15 different countries. Every single country has their own version of shooting arrows. That's how we test for quality. But there's simply nothing you can do, not a thing, that destroys decision quality more than shooting arrows. It fundamentally means virtually all of your meetings between workers and decision makers are a waste of time. They don't add any value. In fact, they take away value because people spend all this time preparing and when they leave that meeting, they have no more insight than when they arrived. All they're trying to do is present at the decision makers, dodge the arrows, and success is not getting hit with an arrow. It's not coming out with more value than we had at the start of the meeting. It's not working the problem to encourage all the decision makers to give their best ideas. It's very passive. I'm presenting at the decision makers. Now I'm presenting, I've got, I come in, I've got 70 slides, I'm gonna get through 13. And I'm hitting page down and I feel pretty good about my slides because I, I made the slides, I practiced them last night, I'm, I'm good at it. And I'm getting page down, page down. I'm, I'm, I think I'm killing, I'm doing a great job. How am I inviting the decision makers into the conversation as I'm presenting at them and hitting page down? The only way they can enter is what? Uh, Leo, go back a slide. Uh, tell me more about this. How do we know about this marketing assumption? So the only way I'm allowing them into the conversation is by shooting arrows. And shooting arrows does a couple of very bad things. Choices are read since I can only present what I can defend. I can't defend five significantly different choices. So I come in with one and I do all the analysis I can so that I become the salesperson for that choice. If you ask me about the Napa splitter, I would tell you the Napa splitter is the best thing since sliced bread. You have to do it. I had one choice and I would sell, sell, sell that choice. So on choices, I was red because I only had one of them. And I wasn't trying to say, is this a, the best choice? Is it a good choice? I'm saying, this is what you have to do. Prove me wrong. How much knowledge and evaluation do I need? Well, I need enough knowledge and evaluation to answer any arrow that might get shot my way. And if you think about it then, I'm gonna be dark green, not just green. I'm gonna be down into that fourth level of green on knowledge and evaluation because I have to study and prepare for all possible arrows. Now, only 2% of those errors are going to be shot, but I don't know which 2%. So I only have one alternative. I'm red. I've analyzed it to death, which has taken me a long time and a lot of money. So I'm dark green in knowledge and evaluation. Right off the bat, you can see that we're not balanced. And objectives. What do you think my objective was on the NAPA splitter? To maximize the value of the shareholders of my employer? I don't think so. It was pretty clear. Hey, Leo, how's the Napa Splitter coming? Oh, yeah, Napa Splitter, that's Leo's project. All of a sudden, Leo and the Napa Splitter were becoming pretty well entwined. And it became crystal clear to me, if it's funded, I win. If it's not, I lose. So I would be judged on whether I got the funding. So what was I going to do? Build the strongest case and sell, sell, sell. Now, when I got into the meetings with decision makers, how much do they have to add? They're trying to fight off all these wonderful things I'm saying. I'm trying to convince them. Okay? 
th instead, what I'd recommend and what I do now is I have everyone get in and work the problem. The, the working team comes up with all these analysis to sort of educate everybody. And now let's to get together, roll up our sleeves and work it to say, how can we get even more value than we had at the start of this? So think about your meetings with decision makers, not as presentations where you're trying to convince them, but as working sessions where we're trying to get even more than we had uh, coming out of the working team. So shooting arrows makes us red on choices, dark green on knowledge and evaluation, and red on objectives because I'm not trying to maximize value, I'm trying to win and how do I win? By getting it funded. Because if it's funded, I look like a good worker. If it's not, geez, I wonder why Leo didn't get that project approved. That must be, must be a little bit less clever than we had thought he was. Not all questions are arrows. I didn't say questions were bad, I said arrows were bad. Here's a question. Why'd you assume 4% growth in revenues in the next three years? Now you're given the presentation. That arrow gets shot. What happens to your body physically? Why do you assume 4% growth? You step back and it's fight or flight. And you know what? Boom, you come out and you defend 4%. Well, we talked to Sandy in marketing. We looked at this study. Uh, we looked at previous things. 4% seems reasonable. And the decision makers nod their head. Okay, good job. But the thing is, you could have defended 5% just as easily as four and 3% just as easy, easily as that. It was a meaningless conversation. It didn't add any value. All it did at best was say you didn't make a professional error by choosing 4%. Okay? But here's an inquiry, that's an arrow question. It closes down conversation. It focuses on why did you make that one assumption? Here's an inquiry question, which I'm gonna call an opening up. How fast could revenue grow and how, how could we take advantage of a high growth scenario? Now you're thinking, hmm, you're, think what your body does. Hmm, well, I suppose we could do this. It's an entirely different conversation. Rather than closing it down, it's engaging people and say, how can we get more value? So arrows close it down, inquiry opens it back up. Now, what do you do if you share an arrow shot your way? Uh, and they are gonna be shot. There's nothing you can do to stop that. So you have to accept that they'll be shot, but you don't have to, to stop there. So, so here's the arrow. Why do you assume 4% growth? First, address the arrow. Well, here's who we talked to in marketing, looked at this, blah, blah, blah. But then continue as if it were an inquiry. But we also look at what happened if growth was either much higher or much lower than 4%. What if we're wrong? As long as it's above 2%, it makes corporate hurdles, we should move ahead. If it was high as 7%, it would be worth accelerating the effort, going bigger and faster. So the real question is not, is the growth going to be 4%, but how comfortable are it will be between 2% and 7 Because if it's in that range, we're going to do the same thing. So if someone's arguing it's going to be 6 and someone arguing it's going to be 3, I don't care. No matter who's right, we're still doing it. If someone's arguing it's going to be 9% growth and someone else is 5, now I do care about that one because if it's 9, I'm going to take a different path. Okay, so I'm going to tie those arrows into how does that affect my decision making. The intensity of arrows varies. Now, I'm, always, I'm, you know, I'm not going to stop the world's arrows. I'm going to take a little Nerf arrow, hits me in the forehead, cute, okay, fine, move on. Then we've got the normal arrows, but then we've got the crossbow with explosive tips. And now you're publicly humiliated in front of the decision makers, your boss's boss's boss. Okay. What is that going to do to the organization? Well, one, it devastates you personally. Two, you don't want it to ever happen again. So what do you do next time? You take another two weeks to answer even more questions above the uh, uh, questions you'd already answered. So you slow things even more down. You dumb them down by taking out anything controversial. And so the shooting arrows cause the organization to be tentative, to take longer, to go slower. And speed in your decision making is absolutely critical. Speed is, is king. You have to go faster without sacrificing quality, and there are many ways to, to do that. Uh, finally, last slide. Why don't organizations realize full value from their decisions? First, they focus on not making mistakes rather than getting as much value as possible. That's the 10 minus 2. Even if it's better to go for that risk of taking the 10, I just don't want to have a downside, so they to take the safe route rather than the one that has value. They slow down and water down decisions in an attempt to reach consensus. 
everybody, whether they should or shouldn't, have a vote and can be uh, a, a monkey wrench. Right when you're ready to make a decision, someone else can jump in, bring you back to the start again. They don't explicitly define who will decide. If I don't know who has voting rights, it's hard for me to design a process that engages the decision makers. So I have to know who are those decision makers. And they have to be the right ones, because if they're not, the real decision maker is going to come in at the end, upset the apple cart, and back we go to the beginning. People, uh, organizations address decisions too high instead of pushing them down. Decisions should be making, made as low in the organization as you can, such that people are close to the specifics. If everything gets pushed up to the top, the big bosses won't spend much time on it because it seems like pretty small potatoes, and they won't know any, diff any uh, of the details about it because they're not familiar with the, they're so far away from them, they're not familiar with it. Uh, they hold discussions which bring them no closer to decision. So it's almost like, okay, here's Monday, we're gonna talk about the same topics. And you have these discussions, but you never get close to making a decision. They get too many people involved with too little to contribute, or they leave off important people who should have been engaged. Finally, they spend too much time presenting to decision makers, not enough, enough time engaging with them. So think about doing, rather than coming in with that 70 slide deck of what you're gonna go through 13, Come in with three slides and say, based on everything we've looked at, here is a key issue, and we'd like to discuss that issue and get your uh, input, decision makers, so we can really make this thing better. So think about these as working sessions rather than trying to convince them through the power of your presentation and your discussion. That brings me to the uh, end of our uh, uh, session. I think now we have uh, a question time. Go ahead and submit some questions, and I believe we have some uh, ready to go as well. And Christy will come back up and, and read off the questions for me. So, thank you, Leo. Um, first question, how do you determine priority of decisions? Uh, there's a tool, it, it, it's an important part because there's, there's always more things to work on than you can. And the tool I use is called the leadership agenda. Uh, and the idea is, uh, think about all the topics you could work on this year, all the decisions you can make, the, the, and, and think about, okay, well, I could cho choose to deal with this expansion into Canada. That's one thing. Put an idea in a yellow sticky. And then what's the other thing? Well, I could think about uh, trying to settle this lawsuit people are suing us. So you have all of a sudden 200 possible concepts on these yellow stickies. Now, you can't deal with all of them, so what are the priorities? So draw a line, a horizontal line. Take that first sticky, okay, expansion to Canada. Is that above the line or below the line? If it's above the line, it's one of our priority decisions that we need to deal with now and in the coming months. If it's below the line, it can be delegated or delayed. So the way I go through prioritizing decisions, and I go through the rest of my, all my yellow stickies, when I end up with this 20 stickies above the line, a bunch below, I go through it again and I take that 20 down to seven or eight, is having a conscious conversation before you jump in to start making decisions as to which ones should be made by this group. So if I'm a leadership team, I've got six people there, that's expensive time. Six people, high dollars, all in one room. I want them only to spend time those above the line items, not the below. Many of the below the line items can be taken by one of those members in the leadership team. They don't need everybody. So that's the way you do it, have a conscious conversation about which things require the full engagement of all of our leadership team, then dig into those. Don't just start, okay, here are a bunch of topics, let's get going on them. Next. Um, how do we determine the objectives? How do we determine the objectives? Uh, you know, in, in some sense, uh, who are the players, what do they want? It's actually a tool, you make a, a column, each column is a player. So I might have senior leadership as a player, uh, my division is a player, uh, the workforce may be a player. So, so when you think about the columns, you think about who should be, uh, whose voice should be heard. And then you ask for that player, okay, the senior leadership, what's the most important thing for them? Okay, once you get that, what's the second most important thing? What's the third? Okay, now I go to the next column, the division leadership, what's the most important thing, second, third? So each of my columns will get three or four things with the first row being the most important, second row being second, third, fourth. And now what I have is a view of each of the players and their, what they want in order. But you might say, well, Leo, I, I don't work with the executive committee, so I don't know what the leadership team wants. Great. 
make your first uh, uh, cut at it, do your best guess, and then show it to someone who works with the executive team or show it to someone on the executive team. What they can say is, yeah, that's important to us, that's important, but geez, we don't care about this and you miss this other thing entirely. So if you make it explicit, even if you're not correct, you can show it to somebody else and quickly be corrected. So the goal is not to do it perfectly yourself, but rather than have, okay, maybe if you, if you thought about it for two weeks, you get it perfect. I'd rather have you think about it for 15 minutes, a half hour, show it to someone who knows more than you get their reaction. So now in 45 minutes, you've got it done. So that's how you get the objectives. And this is the last question, and I think a nice segue to what you're talking about. Is it better to start a process over when the objectives aren't met or to continue going back and forth? Uh, the going back and forth, there's a real date. Most organizations have projects that will never die. There are initiatives. Uh, no one remembers why they were started. Uh, no one remembers uh, how they are. No one remembers how it was supposed to end. And if you just start circulating, going back, you're never going to get any place. So when, if you're having trouble with the thing, here's, your, here's what you do. And this is sort of the, the lowest hanging fruit I can give you on decision making. Uh, if you, whether you're, it, particularly if you're having problem and you have to go back and redo it, but on any project I'd, rec I'd, I'd uh, do this, uh, recommend doing this, decisions are projects, not processes. And think about it this way, a process goes on forever. So accounting is a process. You never win accounting. There's always more accounting to do. You have milestones, quarterly closes, but there's, the accounting goes on forever. Decisions are projects. They have a start, middle, and end. And if you put an end date on your project and then work back, all of a sudden people are driving toward making a decision rather than talking about it endlessly. So for example, we're gonna make this decision on uh, November 30th, meaning we need the alternatives developed on November 1st, meaning we need the alternative, uh, the business assessment by October 1st. So now all of a sudden we have milestones all driving towards that decision date. So if you're having trouble on a project, if you're recycling, put an end date on it, it does wonders. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that concludes our session today. Um, please join us for um, Leo's two-day session on decision-making and execution. He covers over 15 tools um, to make better decisions. Um, if you work for an organization and you feel like this is a, a, a message and some training that your team, your leadership team would value, um, please contact me, Christy Burdick-Travis, and we can look, look at doing a custom program for your organization. Thank you so much for the time today, and we hope to see you on campus soon. Thanks.